so honored to be here with such an esteemed group of people. Um, the former ambassador of Mexico, he was fascinating. Wasn't he fascinating? Does history come alive in this room? So I am happy to be here, and I want to thank the Mexican American Cultural Educational Foundation because this is what they're doing. They're promoting these history makers that some of us may not have known about. How many of you knew about his life and his work? Amazing. Now you all know, and this is something that is a source of pride, and we need uh, our heroes to be um, highlighted like this. So thank you so much. Well. To start, I was born to survive. I was born to thrive, and I was born, born by a river. Let me explain what I mean by that. I'm going to read a passage from the book, Eight Ways to Say I Love My Life. I wrote a chapter in it, and this is how I was born. Weaving her way through the endless rows of the towering green and golden cornstalks surrounding her home in El Rancho de Contreras in Momac, Zacatecas, she was determined to get to the midwife in time to deliver her fourth child. Contractions accompanied her every step, but she was out of time. As she came to the river walk, reaching for a tree branch for strength, she let out the last of her labored breaths and my chrysalis complied and I inhaled the first of mine. She knew what she had to do. And she knew she had to do it quick. Lacking the implementations of a midwife, using her prim primeval ingenuity, she reached for the sharpest rock. She measured the umbilical cord, four fingers wide, as she had seen the midwife do with her other three pregnancies. She dragged the rock across the umbilical cord and swiftly severed it. She tied it with a rebozo, and she gently wrapped me around in it. I was ready to embark on my life's journey. From my mother, Amalia, I learned my first lesson. In order to survive, one needs to be resourceful, resilient, and tough. And my mother was tough. Thank you. So, I came, I was born in Mexico, and I was a Mexican until 1995, when my husband said I had to stop complaining about the people in D.C., Washington, D.C., because I didn't have a voice because I couldn't vote. So I decided to become an American citizen in 1995. But I will always be the corazón, a Mexican, American, or simply a Mexicana. It's in my bones. It's in my blood. I was six years old when my mother brought us to the United States. And it was in the early 1960s. And the first couple of years, I was confused. We went into this city, uh, this the largest city in, in the country, one of the largest cities in the country. And then we went into and were in a blended family. We lived in Boyle Heights right across the bridge here. And we were six people living in a one-bedroom apartment. And it was just so confusing. I didn't know the language. I, I was embarrassed because I couldn't speak English. And yet, I was my mother's translator. She would take me with her when she would go to the doctor or when she would go to the government offices or to the market. And I had to figure out the language. I remember one time being at the store, and she sent me to go get salt. And I didn't know how to say salt in English. And so I was there for hours going, um, I want some salt, some salt. And they couldn't understand me. So it was pretty embarrassing. And so I didn't know where I fit in. I would watch TV, the Spanish language telenovelas, and all of the stars were these blonde, blue-eyed girls. And I'm like, no, that's not me. So then I would watch the English language TV, and I would see, you know, blonde women who didn't look like me, or maybe a prostitute who was Latina. Um, or there was this one guy on The Real McCoys. It was a man. They called him Pepino. But that wasn't relatable to me. So like, I was you know, very confused for a while. And it wasn't until I was 16 years old while, while attending Roosevelt High School, which Dr. Julian Nava also went to, if you, if you heard him. Um, it wasn't until then that I kind of figured out who I was. 
It was my second year in high school, and they were offering a folklorico class, a Mexican dance class. And I remember thinking, this is for Mexicans. I'm Mexican. This is for me. So I got into the folklorico group, and I started learning how to faldear and zapatear. And I started learning my history because I had to learn where these dances were from. And so I was learning history that was not taught to me in school. And so I really loved the zapateado. I really loved the school. And I was happy. So... Um, when I would dance with the folklorico group and I would hear the Mexican music, I was filled with pride. It was something I had never experienced because I never knew who I was. They didn't teach us that in school. And so what lesson number two that I learned was that you need to feel you belong so that you know where you fit in. Knowing your history is something that's going to give you strength to feel good about yourself, to be the best that you can be. At the same time, when I was in high school, I was also introduced to the Chicano movement. Now, it was amazing to learn about Villa and Zapata and, and Che Guevara and the struggle and the issues. And this taught me my history again, because they didn't teach it. What, how I was taught was through a group called UMAS, which was the United Mexican American Student um, Group. And they taught all of this to me. And I also learned about the issues that were close to home. I learned about the conditions in high school and the lack of college prep. And I was also part of the student movement. And it was so awesome to walk and march down to the edu uh, Board of Education in the streets, 200 of us yelling, Chicano power! We were activated and we knew we had rights and we were going to get them. Lesson number three, speak up. It is better to be heard than to stay silent and endure what you know isn't right. You matter. Stand up. Speak up. And you can affect change. So I was passionate about my, my dance and I lived it and I breathed it and I, and I would practice my zapateado all the way from home to high school, which was two miles to and from. And we were crazy little girls just dancing in the streets. And I went just on to study other kinds of dance. Oh, I went on to study ballet and jazz and, and uh, the boogie. And then I left to Mexico because I wanted to study with the queen of Folklorico, which was in Mexico City, El Ballet de uh, Amalia Hernandez. So I went to study there. I came back to LA. And then I was the assistant director for my mentor's um, group, which was Teatro Mexicano de Danza. And that opened a lot of doors for me, confirming that Mexican, being Mexican, was cool. And that pride has stayed with me throughout my life. It has given me, has given me the sense of belonging and the need to speak up and represent and promote my Mexican heritage and my community. So lesson number four, be passionate. Find what you're passionate about and follow your passion. And with each gig that I got, I learned as much as I could because I would use what I learned for the next opportunity that came by. I would present it myself. So my dance skills led me to auditioning for Zoot Suit, Luis Valdez's play, and I got into Zoot Suit, and it was my first professional acting job, and one of my cast members is back there, Mike Gomez, he was, he was in Zoot Suit, too. I met a lot of wonderful people, and there he is, one of them. <laughs> uh, and so I was, uh, I was at that job for a whole year. It, that play lasted a whole year. And um, after that, I, learned, I started learning about acting, and I decided that I wanted to be an actress. So I started taking classes, and I started acting and learning all the ropes in Hollywood. And I was able to work in film and TV projects with actors like Alec Baldwin, Raul Julia, Edward James Olmos, Jennifer Lopez, my husband Enrique Castillo, Kevin Costner, Mario Lopez, a whole bunch of people. And at the same time, my Chicano activation came into, in, in, into play again. Remember, what you learn follows you into the next thing that you do. We were always complaining about the lack of roles of Latinos in Hollywood. So we would go to our union and say, what are you doing? How come we don't have any roles? Why don't we have this? Why are they stereotypical roles? So we were always complaining. And further down the line, this helped me to give us courage for when they were casting Frida. 
a movie that was being cast and they said they, they couldn't open up to auditions for Latinas because there were no Latinas that were talented in Hollywood. That's what they said. So we got upset, a bunch of us women got together and we protested the fact that they didn't even audition Latinas before they cast the role with a non-Latina. So we all dressed up as Frida, put our little unibra on, and then I even took my daughters to the protest, and we got the press to be there. We were all over, across the country, everybody knew about this protest, and the movie did not get done, but it made way for Selma Hayek, 10 years later, to come and do her movie. So that is a lesson that we learned that protest led to the magazine Latin Heat because they said that there weren't any Latinas who were talented or actors. So we decided to put together a magazine, a trade magazine that would show all of the Latinos that were there and that were talented. And so that's how I started, went into my next gig. Uh, after that, you know, as I became the CEO and the publisher of Latin Heat, the trade magazine, and once uh, I was doing that, that led to us being online, and then that led to producing. So one thing leads to another. So learn as much as you can in one job, even if you're just the receptionist or you're just watching the door. You are going to maybe meet someone that walks through there. You're going to discover or someone's going to discover you. You never know, but you always have to be engaged and learning as much as you can. So lesson number five, stay Curious, keep learning and keep growing. Go beyond what is expected of you. So now I am a businesswoman and life as a businesswoman was exhilarating. It was my second passion. It is my second passion. And it was better than acting. People love the magazine, both the industry and the talent. And we were written up in magazines, featured on CNN and on the radio and TV. And I was able to interview like the big stars, you know, Salma Hayek, George Lopez, Cheech Marine, and others. And there was so much to learn about the publishing world that I didn't know. Now I'm playing catch up because this was the only time that I made this big jump because all the others were in an entertainment trajectory and now I'm in the publishing world. So I was able to uh, attend the Stanford University Publishers course to catch up on the latest in publishing. And I remember there was this one guy there, crazy little guy. His name was Jeff Bezos and he was talking about Amazon. I remember he was talking about Amazon and we're like, whoo, went over our head until now he's, he is Jeff Bezos. And one of the persons that was responsible for me going to the Stanford Publishers course is right there. His name is Kirk Whistler. And he called me and said, so yay for you. He called me and he said, Belle, do you want to go to this publisher's course? And I'm like, oh, heck yeah. So there I am walking into Stanford going, OK, I'm ready for my, I'm ready for my education to start. So um, I was. Um, lucky enough to be a friend of the publisher of The Hollywood Reporter, which was a big, big trade, the big trade, and it's, it, trade, and it's still around. And he was my mentor. And every so often, we'd get together, have lunch, and we would talk shop. We would talk about you know, the publishing business and the, and the trades in Hollywood, the news in Hollywood. And then I also had another friend at the Academy of Television, and uh, she, d she recommended that I be on the board of the Peabody Awards. And the Peabody Awards are very, very high awards that they give out every year, very prestigious. And so I was on the board for six years. And I would never have imagined that this little kid from Boyle Heights would be standing before all these luminaries of actors and producers and, and directors and, and be speaking to them from the podium at the Waldorf Astoria as, and in my last year as the board, the chair of the board of the Peabody Awards. It was amazing. That was like a pinch myself. Wow, somebody from Boyle Heights did this. I love Boyle Heights, as, as you can see. I keep saying it. And uh, as exciting as that was, it wasn't easy running a business. It was the hardest thing I have ever done. And we published and we printed 13 years. And then when it got too expensive, we went online. But keeping a business going is hard, and we went down twice. And the first year, I was devastated. And I was depressed for a whole year until I looked around and said, OK, 
time to get up, keep going, and go back to my mother's lesson, to be resourceful, resilient, and tough. And here we are. We're still here after 27 years. So, thank you. So lesson number six, when you stumble, don't quit. Take a break, dust yourself off, and keep going. When times get tough and you get discouraged, get tough and get going. So what have I learned in my life? I've learned that I can be anything I set my mind to. And I know this is something that kids are taught every single day nowadays. You can be whatever you want, especially the millennials, and they've learned that message, message well, because they, they go out there and they do feel like they can do everything and anything they really want. I never had somebody tell me that. No one ever told me I could do anything I wanted. And growing up and going through all my life and being and doing everything that I did, I learned that I could do anything I want. I learned that at about late, late 30s, early 40s, and so now I'm making up for lost time. You know, I, I, um, I've learned that anything I want, all I have to do is look at it, study it, learn it, and do it. When Hollywood said there was no talented Latinos, we set out to prove them wrong, and we created a magazine to highlight the talent. When we got tired of asking ABC, the ABC network to please put a Latina on the view, they never did. We said, that's OK. We're going to create our, our own TV show. And we created Let's Talk. Then it was Hola LA on KCBS and KKL9. And now it's The Trend Talk. And my co-host and producer is right here, Naiba Reynoso. <laughs> when our protests for better roles from, and asking Hollywood over and over again through our magazine, through protests, when are we going to get better roles? When are we going to get more roles? When is there going to be a Latino superhero? When they went unheeded, when they, nobody paid attention to us, we got tired and we started writing our own stories. This book here is eight stories by eight Latinas who wrote about their lives. Not one stereotype in this book. And like this book, there are others, and Kirk can tell you because he has the book awards. There are so many stories that are coming up, and they're being made into film. So that, this is not just about Hollywood, because we could do that in every sector of society. In politics, if you want to see government addressing our needs, what do we have to do? We have to register to, register to vote. Vote for the people that are helping us and vote the people that are calling us rapists and criminals, vote them out. That's the power we have. And in closing, I'd like to give you guys a little secret, which isn't really a little secret anymore. Latinos and Mexicans in particular are trending in every sector of society. We no longer need to bow our heads, letting others tell us who and what we are. We are the future. We are the new mainstream America. So here are a few reasons that we should all be proud. The Latino buying power of which Mexicans make up 66% is at $1.7 trillion a year. Without, without us, the US economy would take a major dip. Carlos Slim, the richest person in Mexico, is worth an estimated $58.1 billion. And just a few years ago, he was named the richest man in the world. Have you heard recently about the eight-year-old Mexican girl, Adhara Perez, who has an IQ higher than Einstein or Stephen Hawkins? We are the future. We are the mainstream. And finally, it is so important to give back to your communi community. This is what this group does. Never forget where you came from, which was the message that Dr. Julia Nava gave us. If you have achieved your goals in the room, and there's a lot of accomplished people here. Rosalio, who was one of the main guys that was involved with the Chicano movement from UCLA. And uh, uh, I, oh, and, um, 
Jerry Velasco, who is a, a mayor of El Monte, and Armando Duron, who's been in this industry forever with the entertainment industry. I don't want to say how, however, okay? For, it's forever. And um, the, everybody's accomplished. And if you are someone that I don't know and you're an accomplished person, I know we all know the importance of being a mentor, of reaching back and pulling the person up and saying, hey, this is the way to go, or go here, or I have a friend. Like uh, Dr. Julian Nava said, I have a friend. Connect. Let's connect each other. And that's all I want to say, that I'm very proud to be a Mexican. I'm, I'm so happy that this, this group exists because this is what it's all about. It's about highlighting us. And we are the group, Mexican Americans are the, is the group that is more, most malign. It's always like, oh, Mexicans. Are, and we're always the ones that are getting pushed aside. But I also wanted to give a shout out to George Lopez because I told him, you were the guy that made it cool to be Mexican. When you had your show, you would say, I am Mexican. And so that allows people to say, oh, well, I think George is cool, so hey, maybe Mexicans are not you know, what we say they are. Or that, that's just something that this organization is about. It's about lifting us when other people push us down. But I think that the difference now is that we know our capabilities, whereas before, we weren't sure about our capabilities. But we know who we are, we know what we can accomplish, and I think that that's a hurdle that we've passed, and it's just gonna be great from now on. P please, pass around the message about this organization, follow us, be involved, bring some people next time to come and hear these awesome history makers that Dr. Jose Luis Ruiz brings together. Thank you. Wow, wow.